um, the peaking process is very difficult. You know, in order to peak, by definition, you have to lose fitness. You know, and so how do you how do you reconcile that in your mind as an athlete? I'm losing fitness, but my race is eight days away. You know, and well, you know what? You have to lose fitness in order to peak and let the form shine and come through. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. So last week we talked to Stephanie and Ben Bruce, who are role models to so many of us for the way they're able to handle two professional running careers and two young boys who are only nine months apart. But they're also really real and genuine and not afraid to show their struggles. So if you didn't listen to that one last week, make sure you go back and check it out. Now, if you've known of Runners Connect for a while, you probably know that we believe the best thing any runner can do is get themselves a coach. But I know, I know, it's really expensive. Why do you need to? It's just running. Those are probably some of the things you're thinking. Well, today you're going to hear from Dirk Friel, who's the founder and CEO of Training Peaks, who's going to convince you that no matter what level of runner or triathlete or cyclist or kayaker or anything you are, having a coach, having that outside opinion is going to make a huge difference. If you're an experienced runner, you might actually get something different out of it and maybe actually you could become the coach and help other runners with their running journeys. So I've been a huge fan of Training Peaks for years and I think after this episode you will see why. Runners Connect and Training Peaks have a lot of the same philosophies when it comes to running and even if you don't decide to go with our coaching program, I think you're going to get a lot out of Training Peaks because it really is a great place to be and not just for coaching but as you will hear some of the other things they have to offer. So we'll just hear a word from Jabra and then we'll be on to Dirk. If you're a regular listener, by now you know who sponsors this podcast. Jabra, of course, with their wireless, sweat-proof, weather-proof sports earbud that I absolutely love. Remember, you can enter to win a free set every month at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. Welcome to the Runs of the Top podcast, Deck. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Tina. Happy to be on board. I'm happy to have you on board. And, uh, you know, we're going to dive into uh, training peak. T- training peaks, if I can say it correctly, a little um, a little deeper in a minute. But I just kind of want to give our listeners a bit of a background on you. Um, you are a bit different in that you're not primarily a runner, but you do, you know, obviously do some training runs um, just for general fitness. But yep. could you kind of share your, you know, your background um, growing up with fitness and where you kind of um, came from, so we can kind of lead into how the training peaks idea came up. Yeah, no problem, and. You know, as you said, I'm not uh, a runner, um, but I have done a marathon. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you go. You are a runner then. You can't yeah, deny but it that. Was, <laughs> it was wrapped inside of an Iron Man, and so, uh, anyways. But um, yeah, I mean, I grew up in, in Northern Colorado. My parents were runners, and actually, my dad owned a running uh, shoe store. Oh, interesting. In Fort Collins, Colorado, and it was called Foot of the Rockies. And I, you know, and so in in junior high, I definitely ran a lot and did a bunch of local races. And but this is the early 80s and triathlon was just beginning. And for some reason, you know, being that teenager, (laughs) you know, you you tend to want to rebel a little bit from the parents. And my parents were pure runners. And I was like, oh, there's this cool new sport triathlon, you know, and I can get on my bike and go far. So I was the first in the family to kind of think about training for a triathlon and getting into triathlons. But then once I jumped in and started what I thought training was for a triathlon, uh, I just couldn't get away from the bike. I, it just, I just took to it and I just never looked back. And, uh, you know, I, I probably spent a, a week training to be a triathlete and then I ended up being a cyclist uh, from that day forward. Um, yeah, so I ended up uh, racing, you know, starting in 1982 when I was 12 years old. I got my first racing license. And it's been, you know, ever since I've had held a, you know, a racing license and and raced. Um, But then early on, I fell in love with the concept of racing in Europe. And that was just 
it was like if you're a soccer player, that's where you wanted to end up to mm-hmm. race with the best and and compete with the best. And so I, you know, just had this dream of going to Europe. And I wasn't a small climber. I, I'm a bigger guy. I'm six foot three. I weigh a little over 170 pounds. I raced a little over 160. And so Northern Europe was definitely more kind of for me. And so I moved to Belgium when I was 19. I I dropped out of college, got a one-way ticket to Belgium in 1990, and I stayed for five years. And I did three years amateur, and then I turned professional over there. Um, And then I ended up up coming back to the States, um, starting school again. It took me nine years to get through college, uh, but I would do it all over again the same way. I I just went to school one semester a year and then raced, you know, all the other months of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, And... Yeah, so that kind of leads in the training peaks. Is, and, uh, you know, towards the end of my racing career in the late 90s, I, I retired in 2002, but the family business was coaching. My father, by that time, had written the triathletes training Bible, the mountain bikers training Bible, and the cyclists training Bible. And um, I started coaching, you know, and he started teaching me, you know, the practice of, of coaching. And I coached cyclists and, um, you know, quickly found out that the tools of the trade back then were the fax machine. And we coached athletes around the entire world and we would send faxes, their calendar or their workout program, you know, would either be emailed or a lot of times faxed. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the athlete would fill in their training log in an email, you know, Excel file or a lot of times by fax. And we just had piles of paper piling up in the home office below the fax machine 24 Mm seven. And we would three hole punch that and, you know, obviously read and look at, you know, all the comments and the data, but we just had data fragmented all over the place from all of our athletes. And I I envisioned this web based uh, program where we could deliver a better, higher quality service to our athletes the athlete could access the their training log, their, their training calendar, all their data from any computer worldwide. The same thing um, for myself and the coaches within our coaching group. And that was the impetus for starting Training Peaks was to deliver a better quality service to our athletes. And that's the beginning. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of funny um, it, thinking about it now, actually, like, you know, you, you had this vision and at the time it was a vision, but... Now, seeing how far things have come, like, to, you know, at the time, it was probably you thinking way outside the box and kind of like, oh, you know, I really, I like the idea of this, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. And now if you, you know, look back, it, it's just amazing to kind of see how things have progressed. Um, yeah, certainly. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. And to this day, I still know nothing about software. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> you know, I don't have that background. My You've father didn't. It. <laughs> yeah, we sort of had this vision and this need, uh, and we knew the right people. And luckily, a teammate of mine and a good friend, um, Gear Fisher, uh, you know, he was a web developer. He had a day job, and I went in October of 99, had a beer with him, and kind of pitched this idea of this project I was thinking of, you know, trying to find somebody to work with. And luckily, he said yes. And we started staying up late nights and kind of hacking away and he was the first developer to, to develop it. And we started using it with just about 30 of our own clients, uh, in the early 2000. And then October 2000 is when it was opened up live and in, in terms of like outside of our coaching group and any other coach or athlete could come and actually, you know, start using it. And from day one, it was a pay for service. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still have never taken an ad dollar. It's, it's a, you know, pure at, uh, pay for service uh, model from day one, and really, it from day one until today. You know, seventeen years later, it's still doing the same thing. We solve the need of the coach first, and that's the filter we look through when we develop new feature sets, and we try and help coaches run successful businesses. Mm-hmm. So then could you kind of explain, you know, you just said about, you know, coaches, um, that's, you know, where you are focusing on making that the best for them. So there is a a, a coach edition and an athlete edition. So could you kind of explain what the difference between that is and what you meant by when, when you said, you know, you focus on the coaches first? Yeah, definitely. We, we certainly attract a lot of athletes every day and we have a free 
you know, free account um, within training peaks that athletes can create. Um, but when we prioritize what we will develop, we first try and solve the needs of the coach and help them, as I said, run a successful business. Um, the coach um, addition of training peaks just simply allows a coach to manage an unlimited number of clients um, efficiently. So, you know, really try and streamline their processes. So again, they can deliver a really high quality service. Um, there's a lot of alerts built in and notifications. So for example, if an athlete who's being coached through training peaks, you know, if they upload a training, uh, log workout, the coach could have on an alert to be auto notified every single time the athlete updates their training log. And that then gives the coach you know, they can decide if they need to get back to the athlete right away. I mean, coaching is a 24 seven business. You're never mm -hmm. off, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we have some additional feature sets uh, that are more for the professional coach, um, you know, on the coach edition side, but certainly we welcome any athlete to come create an account on training peaks, even if they're not coached. But we believe that the best way to achieve a goal to hit your race times is through what's called deliberate practice by setting a goal, by getting expert advice, focused, you know, go out and perform focused training and get immediate feedback. That is the ultimate way to improve and achieve your goals instead of doing it on your own and just haphazardly deciding along the way how to train. If you can get expert advice, that's the ultimate goal we try and um, achieve with every athlete that creates an, an account at training peaks. And if you're not ready to hire a coach or it's too expensive, whatever, that's fine. You know, we have training, you know, 6,000 coaches that use training peaks and they publish training plans into our training plan store. So you might start with a $20, you know, eight week plan to do your first 5k run. Um, and, and that's great. You know, that's, that's amazing. But, and then you might, improve from there and get another plan and eventually maybe decide, you know, I want to get a coach. Um, so that's really how we look at um, our different customers as they come in and create accounts. Yeah. And we are, uh, you know, at Runners Connect, we're obviously, you know, very on, along the same lines as you in that, um, you know, you do need that coach and you do need that, that guidance if you do want to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. So it's great to hear that. And I, you know, I, I wasn't aware you had a uh, 6,000 <laughs> coaches on there. That's, that's pretty amazing. And, um, just before I, I have a few more questions about that, but, um, this is, so how, how do runners kind of come into this? Um, you know, you started with cyclists, but can you kind of explain for people, um, listening that, you know, they can use this as runners. It's not just for cyclists anymore. Yeah, certainly. It's quite amazing the different sport types that we have on training peaks. Actually, you know, in the Olympics right now, we have um, kayakers, rowers, um, sailors, as well as triathletes, cyclists, runners. Um, we've had NHL hockey teams. We, you know, it's amazing the, the, the diversity of athletes that, that actually use training peaks. And it can be used basically for any, if you think, endurance sport. Um, and with the advent of obviously the GPS running market, you know, with the Timex Garmin, and great devices, you know, that are now on our wrists and we can track our, our pace in real time, the GPS track, um, you know, when you get done with, there's a lot of value in that data. And so I think runners are starting to realize, you know, like cyclists kind of early on did, you know, they really tended to track all of their data, um, everything from the power to the speed to the heart rate, and they would capture that and, and save it and then mine that data and see the trends over time. So the way I think about data, you might, I don't want to overanalyze today. I think there's more value in how today relates to your past history and where you want to end up going forward. And so simply by collecting and saving that data, there is a lot of value you can gain from especially once you enter this, your second year of saving that data. Now you have a year's worth, an entire season's worth of collected data to now see and 
analyze and say, aha, what went well, what didn't go well, go well, and how should I adjust this next season based upon, you know, my history? Um, and, and runners are certainly definitely now at that point where the devices are cheap enough. It, I mean, you can simply run with an iPhone app now mm-hmm. that's free and hit start, stop, and it'll give you your, your map, your pace, your time, um, and, and upload and, and upload it to a free train. And there's a lot of value in that. Um, so certainly we, we attract a lot of, um, um, runners and we have a lot of running plans, you know, in our, in our training plan store as well. Yeah. And, you know, it has been really interesting for me to kind of see, like you mentioned, there's lots of different sports on there and it's not just, this is just kind of like an all encompassing place for people to go for, you know, programs of whatever kind and um you know you mentioned that you could kind of start with a basic twenty dollar plan and then you could go find another one um and so just you mentioned it earlier and i just wanted you to kind of clarify for anyone listening right now um about you know you you said about the importance of every every like training session everything having a purpose and kind of looking at the data from last year and seeing um how that ties into it seeing what you're missing where where you can kind of improve. Do you want to maybe explain why that is so important? Why you can't just kind of, you know, say you hear a friend who did a certain workout and you think, oh, well, they did that workout. So I'm going to adjust the paces and do that workout. Like what, right. what is it about kind of putting things together in a system that works so well? Yeah. First off, I mean, in, in, in our belief, it's very holistic um, and it should be very individualized. So a recovery day is just as important or more important than your hard session. It's the recovery day that you actually benefit from the hard sessions. So first off, you know, we ideally want an athlete to record every single day, even if it's a day off and just simply put in, you know, day off. Uh, um, Because when you then mine the data and you look at the trends over time, that's very, very important to see when did you recover. Um, So, Again, I mentioned individualization, you know, I, ideally every single one of us can be given an individualized program because every single one of us are are different. We have different, different limiters. We recover at different rates. We have different stresses in our life. We have different work schedules, different goals, and certainly a training plan can get you to a certain level, but as you progress and get better, every single minute of training because becomes more and more important. And what you do with that training session is, you know, it, it has much more value as you get better. And so, you know, just by collecting the data, then we can say, okay, where did you go really well? You know, where did you get injured? Where were you sick? Where did you, you know, lose your motivation? You know, those give you insights into, well, maybe we pushed it too hard. Maybe next year we should only do two weeks in a row and then a recovery week or never do three days in a row of running and, you know, mix it with cycling or whatever it might be. Um, If, and, and also as you get better, volume means less intensity becomes more important of a factor of training than volume at the beginning volume is number one the intensity almost is irrelevant it's just get out the door and do something and do 25 minute run and that's the number goal number one goal is just simply the volume just to try and build up your capabilities of being able to run you know and non-stop um but again as you get back intensity becomes much much more important and then that's where the the value of the data can then shine and help you decide, well, what intensity did I overdo it at? Or how, you know, taking the race data, and it, it's all about making training as race-specific as possible. So, you know, collecting it all. Um, and, you, you know, certainly as an athlete, you may not have the insights into what, what to look for. Maybe you can get a one-hour consultation with a coach and get a phone consultation with a coach just to try and learn more about what to look for. Um, and then you can start to educate yourself or eventually maybe, you know, hire a coach one-on-one. Absolutely. Yeah. We, I mean, we're aligned in so many things there and just, you know, runners connect is, is huge in 
uh, believing in so many of those things you just mentioned. And I love what you said about volume there, and it's so true. Um, And I actually remember myself, um, I know a lot of the listeners, you know, follow my uh, training journey as an elite runner, and um, they've kind of... I remember a few years ago, I was constantly like asking my coach, I need to do more volume, more volume. People were, you know, getting further ahead of me. I need more volume. And he kept going, no, you're doing enough. Like, let's work. Let's focus <laughs> on making the quality better rather than the quantity. And at the time right. I got frustrated, but now I see um, that, yeah, you're right. Like once you do get, um, you know, once you do get going and your body kind of knows what it's doing, then then yeah, the intensity or the lack of intensity and, you know, recovery runs and things is where it really comes together. Yeah. We, we, we had a study where we looked at the Boston marathon finishers and we quartiled them in terms of how they finished in their age group and what predicted the highest, the, the top quartile finishers more than anything was the diversity of their running pace within their training sessions. Hmm. The, 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 between you know the top athletes had a very wide spread between their easy days and their hard days. Yes. So that delta between easy and hard days intensity was wider than those that finished in the you know latter quartiles, whereby their training was much more homogenous, you know more or less the same, if you will, day to day. There wasn't a lot of diversity in their training. And, and that's true. You know, as you begin, you pretty much only have one pace. Um, but to be able to bring in those speed workouts and to be disciplined enough, no matter what level you are, to back it off and have those easy rest days are, you know, very important. Oh, yes. And again, I'm such a such a big fan of that. And uh, I've talked about this a lot, actually, on the podcast about how people don't realize just how much slower you have to run on your easy days. Um, and have you have you kind of uh, seen any difference between maybe runners and other sports, or is it kind of across the board that people struggle with um, taking you know easy days easy, or is it does it tend to fall in certain sports? No, I mean I, you know certainly I see a lot of triathletes, and it, it's a very addictive type nature, almost any sport, right? And as a coach, you kind of, you, you want that. You want an athlete that's addicted. That's, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're always eager to go. Um, but you need to like hold back the reins on them and like mm-hmm. pull them back at the right times. And you have to, you have to be, uh, a, almost a frenemy, you know, with your, with your athletes that you coach or, you know, tough love. Um, so that when they do go too hard, you need to, you know, really kind of crack the whip and hold them back and almost like, penalize them and make them do another recovery day, you know, so they really <laughs> understand it at that moment in time. It's very, very important. Um, the peaking process is very difficult, you know, in order to peak by definition, you have to lose fitness, you know? And so how do you, how do you reconcile that in your mind as an athlete? I'm losing fitness, but my race is eight days away, you know? And well, you know what? You have to lose fitness in order to peak and let the form shine and come through. You, if you show up and you're fatigue is higher than your fitness, you know, someone less fit than you will, can be you. You just don't have that freshness to be able to push through. And that's very, very hard, uh, no matter what the sport is, I certainly. Okay. Oh, interesting. And yeah, so, so true. And I know that, um, uh, we have a lot of people in the running world who kind of say about, you know, it's better to get to the line slightly less fit, but healthy than, uh, you know, get to the line where you're not even sure, you know, if you're going to make it, be it through injury or fatigue, like you mentioned. So that is, right. that is interesting that it is the same, you know, everyone kind of struggles with it. And, and what about, have you seen that people um, who do a variety of sports, maybe triathletes or, you know, someone who enjoys um, kayaking, but they also enjoy, you know, um, swimming or, um, you know, other a variety of sports, basically. Have you seen that those people tend to make bigger gains? Like, have you seen a lot of difference in that or rather than the people who just focus on one area or have you not really come across too much with that? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously the more elite you become, the less you can yeah. do of anything else. So that certainly plays a part in terms of what are your goals um, and, and where do you lie on that scale of beginner to elite. Um, but even at the elite level, you know, being able to take time off, whether that be a month 
you know, within the, the, the calendar, the yearly calendar to kind of regroup and refresh and do things that you're usually you know, not able to do. You know, I remember when I was a pro cyclist, I mean, I, I never went to a mall. Like, it, you know, if my girlfriend wanted to go to the mall and walk, like that was the worst thing I could do. <laughs> I did not walk. You know, I lived like a monk. I, you know, if I was standing, I should be sitting. If I was sitting, I should be laying down, you know, then I should be taking a nap. If I'm not riding my bike, that's the protocol. Um, so then it was so nice after the last race of the year to just throw that all out the window and just be normal again, you know, and being an athlete and setting really high goals, you have to be very selfish. Unfortunately, that takes a toll on your family, your relationships. So to rebuild and, you know, some of those relationships during the downtime can be very helpful, you know, for your life. Um, but you know, if you think about yourself being an athlete for your entire life, you know, ideally that's what we are. We're athletes for our entire lives. You know, what, what are different, you know, cycles that you go through in your life? And currently in, you know, my cycle, my life, you know, I'm trying to learn new sports. I live in Colorado. There's this great new sport called ski mountaineering. There's ski, ski mountaineering races. And I have this endurance junky thing going where it's all, it's running uphill with skis on and then, and then you get to the top of the hill and then you bomb downhill. It's like mountain biking downhill, but you know, it's I, my longest race is in Aspen and it took me seven and a half hours. So I have that really, you know, endurance junkie kind of endorphin going. Um, but I have the really fun downhill and I'm learning like the skills of downhill skiing. Um, or, you know, it, the sport's also called randonnée racing and it's really big in Europe and it's really growing in popularity in Colorado. But um, that's, it's just a new and exciting way to kind of like bring, uh, you know, think about in, when you don't have a clear goal, you know, maybe there could be something else you can bring into your life that where you can stay active and fit, but it rounds you out in a different way. And um, now during the summers, you know, I'm a mountain bike racer instead of I've always been a road cyclist. So now I'm kind of back to square one learning new skills. Um, but I know it's going to help my road cycling, you know, down the road. If I ever go back to road cycling when I'm older, um, who knows what all my, my goals will be 20 years from now. Um, but I, I think diversity as well helps prevent injury. Um, you know, I, luckily I didn't have overuse injuries. You know, I, I raced for 12 years professionally. I think cycling in general has lower injury rates. Um, but I find that just diversity can help um, reduce, you know, injury. Yep. No, I, I definitely agree. And um, I'm a big fan of cross training as well. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage anyone listening who does, you know, say, Oh, I love running. I want to just do running, maybe consider some other things as well. And we do have a great podcast about that, um, that we did last year. And I'll put a link in the show notes, which I guess I'll mention now at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC one one nine. And actually I just want to clarify um, when I say that link, I am saying the letters RC. Um, I've had a few people ask me about that recently. Um, and uh, it is, so it will be the letter RC and then the number of the episode. Just wanted to clear that up for anyone. Um, so um, just a random question I had for you um, that I was thinking right at the beginning and it's just come back to me now. Um, you mentioned about, you know, going off to Europe and kind of uh, dropping out of college. And you just said there about how, um, you know, you kind of have to be selfish if you are going to be the best, you know, at an elite level. How did your family kind of react to that when you when you decided to do that? Like, obviously, it was very hard on them, I'm sure. And, you know, you did go back to college in the end. But um, was that very difficult for them to kind of feel for it? Or were they um, all about like, go get your dreams, whatever you want to do? Yeah, I was fortunate. I mean, and they saw it coming, you know, from age 12 on, I only thought about, you know, racing in Europe and trying to get over there. And even when I, right when I got my driver's license, I mean, mm -hmm. I just took off and drove to Canada and <laughs> did a big race in Canada. You know, I drove from Colorado to Canada, then New York and back to Wisconsin and back to Colorado, you know, one big road trip with another friend. And we were 16, 17 years old at the time. And yeah, I, I think I kind of earned it, you know, in high school, that's all I thought about. If I wasn't in class, I was, you know, thinking about how to get fast on the bike and I had good grades and did a lot of, 
travel um, and even went down to Mexico and raced and, and just kind of earned it, you know, and so there was nothing, you know, surprising about me wanting to somehow get to Europe. Um, and I probably hinted along the way, you know, through research I was doing and how I could maybe make it happen. And, and so I think, you know, the deal I had with my parents was, Hey, okay, you know, they said, all right, that's fine. But you have to go to school at least one semester a year unless you start paying all your own bills. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well, now that's a new goal. You know, like, all right, I got to get pro, then I'll get a contract, I'll get money, I'll pay my way. And that ended up happening. And when I turned pro and got an apartment in Brussels and was doing it all on my own, you know, then I took a couple years off from school, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, when I came back to America and was racing pro here, you know, I just realized I wanted to finish school. Um, that was always in the plan to finish school. Um, so it, it worked out really well with my parents and it was, you know, it was that type of family support that I grew up in. And again, I would do it all over again the same way. And I have a 13 year old daughter now and who knows what she's going <laughs> to end up deciding to do. Um, but hopefully I can support her and, you know, we'll see what happens. Does she <laughs> ride as well? Uh, she rides. She, she's got an engine. I mean, she's oh. tall and skinny. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to celebrate the day she turns a uh, hundred pounds, you know, <laughs> uh, but, uh, she's really into volleyball. Um, okay. and we ski a lot together and, um, she, so that's her, that's her passion right now. Mm-hmm. Is she doing the, the racing with you uphill? The skiing? Uh, oh, actually she does. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have a pair of uphill, um, you know, Alpine touring skis for her. Um, and she's, we, we do short sessions, um, together and, you know, for me, it's, I, you know, finding other girls and women for her to go with, um, it's not, you know, I need to make it. So it's not just dad making her do it. So it's fun when we get to, you know, a group of girls to do it and, and go and you pack, you know, you pack a picnic. Um, so you, you make, there's a reward at the top, you know, and pull out sandwiches and a little bit of a reward. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Great. And um, really cool that you get some uh, daddy-daughter time, although if she's 13, maybe not daddy anymore. Although yeah. I still call my dad daddy and I'm 28, so <laughs> she, so maybe she'll keep going as well. Um, yeah. And then just something random that I thought about. Um, have you heard in Colorado, um, Chris McDougal is a huge fan of it, uh, burrow racing. That's a, that's something you could with the donkeys. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, there you go. There's something you can look at in the future. I know. That would be fun. <laughs> you know, I I really enjoy running, especially on the trails. Okay. You know, I'm, when I'm in the mountains, isolated, running through the trees, mm-hmm. I truly enjoy that. I don't enjoy it when I'm in the city, running mm-hmm. in cement, dealing with cars, you know. Mm-hmm. So when I when I get up to the, you know, I go frequently, you know, to the ski resorts in the summer just to kind of get away from the heat um, and I'll often run and that's just a pure enjoyment, you know, yeah. activity for me. Yeah, no, that's great. And, uh, you know, trail running is something that, um, most, you know, newer runners kind of shy away from cause it slows you down obviously, but, um, it takes a while before you kind of appreciate the beauty of it. And it's, it's nice to see that it's finally growing in popularity as well. Getting no, we, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that growth. You know, I would mm-hmm. say a lot of our growth in running is primarily because of the trail scene and the ultra endurance, you know, the, the hard rocks, you know, the hard rock in Colorado or the Mont Blanc, you yeah. know, racing in Europe and the sky series and all that. So, yeah. um, that's, that's been very beneficial. Um, and that's certainly, we've seen growth from that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and then, so I wanted to ask you a question, which I don't know if you'll have the answer to this, but it's something that I've, uh, was thinking about as soon as I kind of researched you a little bit more, but you know, you came up with the idea for training peaks, um, and you kind of, you know, discussed it with some others. And obviously your dad was a huge, um, influence as well. But, um, do you think that, um, you know, people like runners or especially people who are taking their training to a really serious high level where they you know, every little bit makes a big difference. Do you think those kind of people are good at coming up with, you know, solutions for problems for businesses? So I'm thinking, you know, people listening who may have had, you know, a previous career, um, you know, now masters athletes kind of running was their passion and now they've kind of, you know, they're on the downhill, but uh, want to still stay involved in the sport. Would you encourage people to kind of 
look for solutions to problems that they had to, you know, set up their own business potentially? Yeah, I think having an athletic background is very advantageous towards, you know, running a business and setting goals is certainly very much in line with running a business and, you know, having athletic goals um, and the process of how do I achieve that goal? You know, and and we might all have these goals out there, but you can't really, you can affect what you're doing today. That's the only thing you can affect. You can't affect what your competition is doing by saying, you know, I, I want a podium, that's great, but that's kind of reliant upon your competition. So, okay, in order to podium, I need to get stronger, I need to reduce my injuries, I, you know, some very objective measures that you can affect today, which then increase your chances of reaching the podium. And that's the same in business. You know, I can't affect our competition, but I can affect what we do today, and I can help guide the company give a clear vision and hope everybody in the company you know, sees clearly what vision is the role, achieving that, that vision. But it's what can they affect today that can then lead up and roll up to achieving the, the business goals. You know, a lot of that is just in, in parallel and, and just the hard work ethic, ethic mm-hmm. that athletes tend to have and the never say die or, you know, <laughs> type of mentality um, and that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur. You know, it, it's all on your shoulders. You, as a one man shop, you, you are everything from accountants to, you know, you, you're, you think a business, a businessman being an entrepreneur, a technician and a manager and starting out, you have to be all three, but as you grow, you then need to specialize and you need to be very honest with yourself. Where am I weak as a business person? Ver- and You need to do that with your athletic life as well. Where am I weak as, where are my limiters as an Mm -hmm. athlete? And who could I seek out to help me get better in that area? Very much the same thing in business. So a lot of lessons can be learned um, from athletics that can be transferred over over to athletics or to business, sorry. Um, And we hire a lot of musicians. You know, it's a a very same type of thing. Musicians Mm -hmm. are just like athletes. They're, they have a goal. They have to improve. They have deliberate, deliberate practice focus practice, um, you know, expert advice, immediate feedback. Um, they train as many hours as an athlete or more, you know? Um, and so it's, you know, we find the same thing within the music world. Huh. Wow. Amazing. I would never, never pick that up, but that's, yeah, yeah I guess it does make a lot of sense. Hmm. <laughs> yep. And we, you know, if you ask athletes, a lot of them have a music background, you know, in school, yeah, they may have true. started, you know, in school and done very well on whatever it might be, you know, musical, musical instrument. Um, but then, but then they ended up later in life discovering the marathon, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. And, and yeah, very, very good advice there. And, um, I just have one more question for you before we get on to the final kick round, but I just, before we do, I just want to thank, take a minute to thank our sponsor. Most of us are now in the middle of summer. That means the temperatures have soared and running becomes a little more difficult. We dream of those cool fall mornings and remind ourselves that those tough days now will pay off big time later, or so we hope. I find a distraction helps a lot and Jabra Pulse is just what you need. The wireless sweatproof earbuds make it nice and easy to listen to podcasts or music through Bluetooth on those days we are on board the struggle bus. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or by the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. All right. So uh, Dirk, um, Outside Magazine uh, voted um, Training Peaks as one of the best places to work. And um, I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about, you know, maybe this you'll feel a bit too uncomfortable answering this, but what it is about Training Peaks that makes it such a great place to work. And, um, you know, maybe some of the um, some of your pr- pride points, I guess, from working for the business. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we kind of live the life, you know, um, we, you know, many of our employees obviously have a passion for endurance sports. That's why they were attracted to work for training peaks in the first place. 
And when they start working for us, you know, we allow them to continue, you know, living that life. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a gym, you know, in our office, we have a locker room, towel service, lots of free food, lots of free drinks, (laughs) you know, uh, you know, we get lots of great deals in the industry, which, you know, we can take advantage of. We have amazing athletes that come through, you know, our office. Um, you know, the Gauchers come in, Kara, Adam Goucher, you know, um, we have world champions that come through. We have a hall of champions, um, in our, in our office where a lot of jerseys and, you know, are signed and posters by our, by our customers. And then we get to see our customers, you know, in the Olympics. And that's really, really, really special to be a part of that journey to help them achieve a gold medal. Um, and you get to go out and do a run or a bike, whatever it might be. Think, and you're just thinking you're in that mode and you're like, you know what? It'd be really cool if we did this or that. And so you can then come back and try and get that idea, uh, built. Um, so you're, you're, you're living inside that world. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great. Um, you know, we, we, it's a balance obviously. Um, and it's, it's all about teamwork. You know, we say teams work and, you know, every person's a member of a team and they're accountable and responsible to that team. Um, And so, you know, it's very much a balance of live the life, but be accountable to your team at the same time. Um, And I think we're very generous in terms of our benefits. We give every employee uh, $1,200 a year to spend on anything athletic related Wow. They could spend that on coaching. They could buy a bike. They could buy skis. They can get massage. They can join a health club. You know, um, so we just offer that as a fringe benefit. Um, you know, to try and help them. Uh, you know, live continue to live that passion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure a few people are wondering right now: Are you hiring right now? <laughs> uh, yeah, we. Know, we <laughs> kind of hiring. Um, yeah, if you go to Training Peaks at the bottom. Um, there's an about, I believe, and that'll lead to a careers page. Um, we, uh, I don't know off the top of my head what we are right now, but we tend to always have some type of position open. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- more than likely, yes. <laughs> okay. I will put a link to that yeah. in the show notes as well, which again is at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC one one nine. Um, yeah, I just thought people would be, would be wondering that right there. <laughs> and, yep. um, what about like the coaches, you know, you said you had 6,000, um, is, are you, you know, at a limit or anyone listening right now who maybe is, you know, coaching a few athletes, are they still able to join now? Oh, most certainly, you know, and a lot of our athletes are, sorry, a lot of our coaches started out as athletes on training peaks. Mm-hmm. So you might start out as an athlete and then your friend asks you for advice and you become a mentor to your training group. And you're like, wow, this would be really great to kind of do this on the side and, mm-hmm. Maybe they'll pay me 50 bucks a month. And you, that's a lot of how, you know, you be, you get into coaching is just, you just absolutely love helping other people and you love spreading that, that knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, of course, you know, anybody that, that is interested in helping others or being a coach, um, you know, you can set up a free coach edition trial uh, at trainingpeaks.com. Um, we have an online university, um, so if you are interested in learning more about how to leverage training peaks within your coaching business, you know, we have educational resources for coaches. Um, we have an endurance coach summit. We just had our second annual, uh, it was about two weeks ago in Boulder, Colorado. We had 110 coaches oh, attend. It's a two day, um, conference, um, on, you know, it, the science and the business of running a coaching company is really how to define that. Um, so we really try and, um, have a lot of educational resources to help, um, coaches, you know, learn from others. We're trying to build a community of coaches as well, whereby we can share best practices, um, and share, you know, um, cause it is a very young profession, if you will. Mm-hmm. If you think 20 years ago, how many people, how many people were, were charging money to coach runners that, you know, most running coaches 20 years ago were working for colleges yeah. or the Olympic committee there. There's a lot of training clubs, of course, you know, 20 years ago. 
Um, but I think it really kind of started with triathlon and cycling and they kind of, those sports sort of pioneered the world of, you know, coaching as a career outside of the Olympics or the collegiate aspect. Um, so yeah, certainly happy to help anybody that's, uh, thinking about starting a business and, uh, however large or small. Mm-hmm. No, and I, I love that you've kind of, uh, you know, you've taken this in so many directions and you really want to, like you said, help build a community and, you know, you really, you are trying to help others. And, um, you know, as I've mentioned a few times, Runners Connect is very similar in the, the mindset we have with things. And, you know, the, the athletes we coach are also the same thing. The, the, primary focus is having that community for everyone to kind of, you know, check in with one another and, you know, support one another. So it's great that you, right. you have that and you've, you know, also got additional offerings as well. Um, so I just have the final kick round questions for you. So okay. starting with what is the greatest advice you have ever received? Uh, probably a little bit of marriage advice from my father. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's getting too personal. Um, no? Anyways, you know, he said you can either be right or you can be happy. Mm, so and true. And you can't, you can't be both at the same time. So I choose to be happy. <laughs> no, that's really good. And actually, that's something <laughs> I'm really trying to work on. I'm, I'm one of those people that keeps fighting to prove my point. And I'm trying to work on that. So I feel like you're speaking to me right now. <laughs> so to my husband, Steve, I'm sorry. I promise yes. I'm trying. <laughs> okay and um your favorite well you can do any other book um endurance book or sport book if you like but we actually talked about this earlier so i think i know yeah. what you're gonna say uh favorite book or blog other than your own other than training peaks yeah i mean chris mcdougall's you know born to run just kind of putting yourself in that world of you know the copper canyon and you know, the Indians, all that lore. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, kind of lured me in. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, non runners obviously read that book. And so that's probably why a lot of people kind of say that and choose that. Um, so yeah, that's favorite running book. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a good one. Of course we have that, uh, recommended quite a lot. And, um, I actually would encourage you also, um, if you haven't read it to read his second book, which is natural born heroes. Um, yeah. And I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone who wants to listen to the episode um, of the podcast where he came on to talk about that one. But um, it's definitely worth reading and you will probably enjoy it because it's also talking about, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, trail running aspects of it. And if you said that's right. kind of what you enjoyed, then it might be a yep. good good one for the future. Um what would you like to tell? We usually say a new runner, but maybe someone mm-hmm. who just is starting to work out for the first time or whatever you would like to say. Well, this piece of advice goes to anybody, no matter what level you're at, if you're winning the Boston Marathon or you're last place. And I always say, do the least amount of the most specific training at the right time. Ooh, that is a good one. And uh, I think people may need to pause that, pause it right here, just to let that yeah. soak in for a second. So <laughs> the, least, the least amount, because you don't need to overdo it, and of the most specific training. So what's your limiter? What's holding you back? you know, what can you really focus on today at the right time? Absolutely. So that periodization of, you know, when to do, you know, different types of workouts at the right time. And um, anyway, so yeah, I, I, you know, I, being a coach, you know, you can get very, very, you can get so many data points mm-hmm. in your head and so mm-hmm. you get overload of data. And I try and boil it down to just the basics and some of the basics in my head are endurance, force, and speed. You know, yeah. no matter what workout we're doing, it's either isolated endurance, force, or speed, or it's a combination of any two of those. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, again, every single workout is, I kind of try to have those principles in my head. Yep. Nope. That's good. And, uh, you know, we, we love running with a purpose and having a reason. So that's great. Mm-hmm. And actually a side question, um, you mentioned about the, you know, the data and the, um, that you, you know, use a GPS and stuff. Just curious, what, uh, what products do you use for that? Or like, are there any apps you use in specific or any, you know, do you have a Garmin or what kind of uh, brand do you use? Yeah. I mean, I, I have all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> I, I love technology. I love getting new toys. I love the you know, coolest thing on the market. I, I mean, I, right now on my wrist, I have a 
Garmin Phoenix mm -hmm. 2. Um, there's a Phoenix 3 out now, so I'm feeling like behind <laughs> the times. Uh, but I have the Timexes, and, <clears throat> you know, I love the Wahoo app. You know, I'll okay. run sometimes if I don't have my watch and I have just my phone or I'm doing something with the family and I kind of want to get a check on the distance or whatever it might be, I'll open up the Wahoo um, app and that's free and it, you can upload it to training peaks for free. It's really kind of nice. <clears throat> so yeah, I love, I love looking at maps too. Like when I get done, just like looking at, yeah. Oh, next time I could have gone left. Uh, I'm going to do that tomorrow. You know, <laughs> have you ever done a, any of those runs where you've like, or even you're going to, you could cycle too, where you've, uh, you know, cycled a word or, <laughs> oh, no, <I laughs> you know, haven't. people do like, uh, actually yeah. run. So they make a little picture. You haven't done that. I know. No, that's pretty cool stuff, but I haven't, <laughs> haven't personally done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Next on your bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> Write your name in the, in the city that you, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite, um, pre-race meal. Oh, I tend to be like a, a high fat protein guy. Oh, um, me too. and so, you know, I love, veggie omelets with bacon. I love high fat, you know, yogurt with a bunch of blueberries in it. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's my favorite uh, morning breakfast. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. And yeah, <laughs> people know that I'm also the same way. <laughs> um, okay. And finally favorite, uh, well, you may have answered this already, but maybe there's something different favorite, uh, fitness running cycling product. I don't know. I, I guess it has to go back to like GPS. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's probably it. Although, you know, I was in Chamonix, uh, in June and I loved running over there on family vacation. Mm -hmm. And I picked up this, um, Solomon like water carrier and it just slips on the back of my hand. And it's like a, it's like a water, um, you know, flask, or if you will, it's not hard though. It's a soft, mm -hmm. um, you know, soft shell type of water carrier. And it just slips over the back of my hand. And it was, it's just so comfortable to run with for just the, that little amount of water you might need. If you, if you need, a, you know, a bunch more water, you're going to be out there for several hours and you're going to go with a pack of course, but just for that hour run, you know, I found this really nice Solomon. I, I don't even know what they call it, but it's just, it was really cool, really well designed, and you 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 it frees your hand up. It's on the back of your hand, mm -hmm. um, so you can grab stuff. You can you know hold your hands however you wish. It's not a water bottle in your hand that you can't open the door with. You know, yep. Yep. Um, so that was a cool design. Yeah, another example of someone who's pr probably did what you did, where they were like, ah, oh, I want to you know be able to run without oh cycle or whatever without yep. um you know get you you taking up my hand so. It yeah. probably was another example of that. So very good design there. And um, if you can send me a link to that, then I'll put it in the show notes of uh, okay. if people are curious about that. Because I know that is that is very annoying when you're trying to, you know, do things and you have your hand is just taken up with a bottle or whatever yep. it may be. So, yeah, yep. that's great. OK, Dirk. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And um, I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed listening and hearing all about things. So. I will put plenty of links to Training Peaks in the show notes so people can check them out there. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. Most of us are now in the middle of summer. That means the temperatures have soared and running becomes a little more difficult. We dream of those cool fall mornings and remind ourselves that those tough days now will pay off big time later. Or so we hope. I find a distraction helps a lot and Jabra Pulse is just what you need. The wireless sweatproof earbuds make it nice and easy to listen to podcasts or music through Bluetooth on those days we are on board the struggle bus. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or by the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts.